Good morning, grace you and peace be multiplied to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What's going on, Beacon? How y'all doing today? Awesome, man. Good. Thanks for coming out and worshiping with us. If this is your first time here, we thank you for being here and worshiping with us today. My name is Michael, and if I haven't got a chance to meet you yet, man, please come by and say hello after service. I'd love to get a chance to meet you and just thank you personally for being here and worshiping with us here at Beacon Hill. At Beacon Hill, we do something called expository preaching. That is uh, pulling out the meaning of the text as we preach it. We go verse by verse through books of the Bible, and currently we are going through the book of Revelation. It has been a challenging but oh-so-rewarding uh, walk through uh, Revelation, and I am ready to tackle five more verses this morning. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's preaching time. Go ahead and grab your Bibles, open them up with me to Revelation chapter 14, where we'll be studying verses 1 through 5 this morning. If you don't have a copy of God's Word with you today, just raise your hand, and one of our Beacon Hill team members will bring a copy of God's Word for you to have. Maybe you just forgot one. Take it anyways. Use it today and give it to somebody else. We believe that you should have the Word open as I preach it. It's not my words that will change your life, but the Word I preach that can change anybody's life. If you haven't noticed or maybe you get here a little bit late, uh, the pre-service screen will show that there is opportunities for you to get a copy of the sermon manuscript of what I preach. And if you want one, uh, and I encourage you to get one uh, to maybe dig deeper into the Word, just send us a message either on Facebook or see us today after service with your email address, and we will get you signed up to get them. I actually sent them out on Friday this week. Right now, if you're able, I encourage you to stand in honor of reading God's holy word. Revelation 14, 1 through 5. The word of God says this. Then I looked, and there was the lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a, a sound from heaven like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder. The sound I heard was like harpists playing on their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. But no one could learn the song except for the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women since they remain virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were redeemed from humanity as the first fruits for God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for every single soul that you brought in here and every, every um, path that they have taken to get them here today. Lord, I pray this morning that if someone is in here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, I pray that this message would pierce the hearts of the unbelievers to draw them to yourself and the believers to help them release the bondage that they are currently holding on to their lives to worship you fully and completely. Lord, I pray now that I would decrease and you would increase and you would get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have entitled today's message, Eternal Security. Eternal Security. Security is something that we all long to have in our life. We, I don't know about you, but I don't like to be unsettled. I like to have some comfortable, uh, comfortable in my life. I, I like to have. That's why our number one saying is to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Like some of you get unsettled just when someone sits in your seat in the church. You don't like the feeling of not being settled, not being secure. Like when I grew up, uh, and some of you young folks won't understand this, but when I was coming up through college, I was actually told to try to find a job with a retirement program. Uh, they, they literally had these jobs. This will blow your mind, y'all, y'all young folks. They had these jobs that would actually keep paying you after you retired until you died. Isn't that amazing? Like that, I mean, they said, get one of those jobs. And they quickly went away to where I think the only job that you can currently get that still does that is the U.S. government because they don't have a budget that they actually listen to. So that is one of the jobs that you can still get that they will keep paying you after you retire. Matter of fact, my dad still gets paid 
from my mom's job, and she's been dead for three years. What an incredible job to have. Those of you, some of you in here today, retirement is something that you don't even think about. Some of you are just trying to make it to the next paycheck with your bills. And yet, some of you in this room today are just trying to make it to the next meal and trying to wonder where that meal is coming from. But for those in here that try to build and plan for retirement, you often do it through the stock market. And you said, if I don't have a job that will keep paying me, I will just build my own wealth. But if we have found out anything, that the stock market is not guaranteed. It will rise and fall quicker than your stomach can take it. Matter of fact, do y'all remember when Facebook and um, whatever else they own, or Meta, whatever they're called now, uh, went blank for almost a day a couple of weeks ago? It kind of freaked all y'all out because y'all couldn't see my latest status on Facebook. <laughs> but in that, in the, I don't know what you said, but I'm sure it wasn't edifying to me. All right, look. But Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, during that just brief period that Facebook went down, lost $7 billion in wealth. I know he's crying about it, right? But financial security is always fleeting. We don't know when it will be enough. There's not something that's called secure even in our own jobs anymore. As much as there are jobs out there now, we found out quickly last year while the unemployment rate was under 4%, it quickly skyrocketed to over 14% in the span of 30 days because of this thing called the coronavirus. It's been a very volatile 2020 and 2021. We don't feel secure anymore. Many people don't feel secure at restaurants. They don't feel secure in any place but Home Depot because they certainly don't feel secure in church. We see people that are not feeling secure in many places. We're not even secure in our marriages anymore. 52% of all marriages end in divorce. Second marriages are 75%. If you have been married three times, there's an 89% chance that will not make it. Is there anything that is secure anymore in this world? And I want to tell you that there is only one thing that is secure, and that is your life and your salvation in Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you this morning about the security of eternal salvation. Look with me. In verse 1, when the word says, Then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. This text in verse 1 is probably the most clear indication of all of Scripture of the eternal salvation, the security of a believer's salvation. Before you join this church, I actually sit down with you and I ask to share your testimony with me. I want to know how you came to Christ. I don't care how many times that I share the gospel from this stage that people still are confused about what it means to be saved. And as you share your testimonies with me, I've had many people over the years actually come to Christ sharing their testimony. And that is because of the junk that they have heard from many places in this world, from the internet and from pulpits around this world. People don't know what it means to truly be saved. And it's kind of shocking to me. And so that's why I want to sit down with you and I want to hear one-on-one -on -one why you think that you're saved because of how much garbage I have heard in this world. There's many denominations that teach different things that I don't want to bash different denominations, but I want to share some things just from the Bible and from my conversations from pe with people on what they believe or what they've heard of what it means to be saved. Or one, people teach that you can lose your salvation. There are churches that teach you you can lose your salvation. And once again, I'm, I'm not going to, to mention which ones, but they call it a second work of grace. It's crazy, and it just doesn't line up with Scripture, folks. 
So if you're here today and you think you can lose your salvation, I want to point you to the word of God because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to take the word's word for it. John 10, 28 says, I give them, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hands. I tell you what, that no one means no one. The fact of the matter is, if you could lose your salvation, you would. So look, the second thing that people tell me, and probably the most prominent one, is that they think that they could earn their salvation. When I ask people why they think they're going to heaven, they inherently say, I, I do good things. I'm a good person. God knows how good I am, and yet when I read the Bible, the Bible says there's no one good, not, no, not one. None of us line up to the perfection of Christ. Matter of fact, if that's what you subscribe to, or is that a church that's teaching you that you can get to Christ, you can get salvation based on doing good things, there's so much I could share with you today about that, but first and foremost, that would mean that Christ's death on the cross of Calvary was not enough. But I'm here today to tell you, Jesus plus nothing equals everything, church. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says it like this. It is by grace through faith you have been saved. It is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That not of yourself part means not of yourself. That gift means it was given to you, not something you had to work for. So stop trying to please God for your salvation and start pleasing God because you are saved. You have been set free, church. There are people that will teach you that you got to pay for your salvation. This is the last thought we will highlight. You can't lose it, you can't earn it, and you don't have to pay for it. Some teach that after you die, you go to a place called purgatory where you'll have to actually wash out your sins before you go to heaven. Sort of like a spin cycle on a washing machine. You will go to a form of hell until you're made clean enough to go to heaven. Well, I could preach sermons on this. I want to point you once again to the Word of God. Luke 23, 43, when Jesus is talking to the thief on the cross, he said, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Not like when you finish doing that or, or that. He goes, today you will be with me in paradise. That is a promise from Jesus himself. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, you ain't got to leave here today wondering if or maybe you might be saved. The word of God says today is the day of salvation, church. You may have head knowledge of your salvation, but has the knowledge of salvation reached your heart? I can't implore you enough because my conversations show that sometimes it hasn't reached your soul. I said this verse was the clearest indication of eternal security that I can find in Scripture, and I want to get to that right now. The word says John looked, and the word choice that is being used here for God looked is like looking with amazement. You know, you can look, but there's some things that when you look at it, it just gets your attention. Then there's other things that you look at and you stand in awe of. And so the question is, what is John looking at with amazement when he looks at verse 1? There are two options. There are two potential things that, that John is looking with amazement at, and one is when he looks, he sees the lamb standing tall. That is something to be amazed at when you see the lamb standing on Mount Zion. It is something that I, I can't even imagine. I look forward one day to seeing the lamb. But after what we have been studying over the last few weeks, you can imagine and you can understand and have empathy with John of why he would look amazed even though he was with Jesus. He can still be amazed at Jesus. But we have talked about the dragon. We have talked about Satan. We have talked about the Antichrist. We have talked about the false prophet. We talked about the satanic trinity, the relentless pursuit trying to turn people away from Jesus into the evil darkness. 
Yet verse 1 shows us a contrast between the darkness of evil and the brightness of the Lamb. The Lamb is pictured here standing on Mount Zion. In these days, Mount Zion was a reference to heaven. All the despair, you would think that Jesus had gone into hiding. Everything that we've talked about over the last few weeks, you're wondering, where is Jesus in the midst of all of this chaos? Are you or have you been in a point in your life where you're wondering if Jesus is still there? Have you been through moments in your life when you've been through so much hurt and so much pain, you're wondering if Jesus is even real? Is anybody in here with me today? You understand what I'm talking about? I've got news for you. God has never moved. God is where he has always been. He is on his throne. Yet the devil is standing on a shifting sand that will eventually fall away. We don't sing classic hymns much anymore, and I thought about singing this hymn with you today, but after pre-service practice, I was uh, strongly encouraged not to sing this song, so I will just read the lyrics. Unless y'all really encourage me enough, I might sing it. <laughs> not happening, but look, here we go. The word says, on Christ the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Then he says it again. All other ground is sinking sand. When life throws you hurts, when life throws you doubts, get up on the rock and stand with Jesus. Don't let the devil throw shade at what you know to be true. Stand amazed at the Lamb of God who is where he has always been. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So don't believe the, the devil because he is a liar. There is only one truth, and it comes from Jesus Christ. You can certainly understand why John was amazed by what he saw. But is that what John was amazed by? I'm thinking the second part of this is really where John was amazed it was the presence of all the saints. I think sometimes I need a reminder that Jesus is able to keep me when I can't even keep myself, church. I need to know that Jesus is, is who he says he is, that, that, that he will never leave me and he will never forsake me. I know you have your Bibles open because I encourage you to do so, but if you're in Revelation 14 right now, why don't you flip back for a second to Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. Somebody got it, uh, say amen. What does it say, the number of people in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4? It says 144,000. It says 144,000. Now, now, flip back to today's passage, Revelation 14, verse 1. How many people does it say? Mm. It doesn't say 5,000 people were Jesus. It doesn't say 99,000 people were Jesus. It doesn't say 143,000 people. It doesn't say 143,999 people are with Jesus. It says 144,000 people were Jesus. Everyone who was sealed in Revelation 7 is standing with the king in glory in Revelation 14. They had been to war with the devil, and yet here they are standing with Jesus. Not a single one of them was lost. If God is able to keep them during the most violent times of tribulation, don't you think he is able to keep you, church? Mm -hmm. Don't let Satan play mind games with your salvation. Stop trying to earn your salvation and start thanking him for your salvation. There's only one thing that you can be absolutely sure of in this life, and that is your salvation. If you have repented of your sins and trusted Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, then you are saved. That's not believing that it happened. That's not believing that God uh, raised his son from the dead, because guess what? 
Even agnostics believe that because there's too much proof of it to prove otherwise. It is making Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Have you done that today? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? Then I want you to see the second part. I want you to learn how to have joy in your salvation. Verses two through three says it like this. I heard a sound from heaven, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder. The sound I heard was like harpists playing on their harps. They, they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, but not one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Not only did John see the lamb and the 144,000 with his own life, eyes, he also heard them. And don't forget where John was receiving this word. He was on the island of Patmos. He was in exile. He was standing on the side of the mountain where day by day he heard the waves coming and crashing into the shore. So you can understand the word choices that he's using here. He heard the rapids. He heard the rushing. He heard the cascading waters. And the sound was like rumbling peals of loud thunder. You ever been woken up by an intense thunderstorm in the middle of night, you can understand a little bit about what John is describing here. He also heard something like harpists playing on their harps. Y'all, I've heard the Brooklyn Tabernacle choirs. Anybody ever heard them? It's one of the most beautiful choirs I've ever heard. I've heard the shallow metropolitan church choir in Jacksonville, Florida, and they literally bring chills to me and make me cry. But I'm here today to tell you that even the best choir on this earth cannot hold a candle to the choir we will hear in heaven. It was and is truly indescribable. All the words that you have read and movies that you have seen produced cannot possibly, possibly describe the joy that you will have when you get to heaven. Notice they were singing a song that no one could learn but them. The words remain hidden from everybody, including John. This was a song in their final stages of salvation, which is called glorification. A song that they could sing because their faith had become sight. We can learn a lot today from the joy of the saints having their faith become sight. They were able to sing at the top of their lungs because they had been redeemed. They had been set free. We put so much effort and toil into the things of this world when this world is not our home, church. We are just passing through on our way to our forever home. And I don't know about you, but my forever home is not this world. It is not hell. My forever home is in heaven, and I look forward to being there one day. The Word of God says that in my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you so. And I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I've gone to prepare a place for you, I will come back so that where I am you may be also. That just brings joy to my heart. It brings joy that there will be a day where there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more hurt, there'll be no more suffering, there'll be no more drug dealers trying to toy with our minds. There'll be a day when we have been set free forever from the temptations of this world. Your battles will be no more. That is not a hope. That is a promise from the Word of God. And this promise is for the redeemed. This promise is for those who have been bought by the precious blood of the Lamb. Believer in here today, do you realize that you were once dead in your trespasses? You were dead in your trespasses. You know what dead means? It means dead. You had no hope. Your destination, regardless of how good you thought you were or what other people told you, was hell. But one day, somebody shared the gospel with you, and your itinerary changed from hell to heaven. That was the day that you were set free. And church, people in here that know Jesus Christ as Lord of their life, that should bring joy to your heart. 
It should bring a, a new song. See, the songs that, that we sing, it, it, they're not dependent on whether or not we have a battery that works in a guitar. It's dependent on the joy that is in our heart. We don't need instruments. We don't need singers. You don't sing to please other people. When we sing, we sing to an audience of one, the one who has set us free, the one who has took us from the darkness into a marvelous light, the one who has left us and took us from bondage and who has set us free. Do you have joy in your heart today? Do you have joy to the one who has set you free? I don't think I'm halfway through. Is that all right? The songs we sing are not meant to be a chore. They're not meant to be a checklist on your way to lunch today. They're not meant to be done out of habit. They are meant to bring glory to God for him setting you free. Yet, many of us seem like we're dead. Many of us seem like we're still lost, like we're still in bondage. And if you don't know the joy of your salvation, I would ask you today, have you even experienced salvation? Many of you proclaim to be free, but you're acting like you're in bondage. If, if you have been set free, there should be joy overflowing in your heart. This is not a fake joy. This is not trying to like, matter of fact, you know, I heard, I heard a quote today that, that really said, look, I don't care how high that you shout and jump for joy. It's how straight you walk when you land. And look, if you've been set free, you want to please God. You want to sing. You, it's the overflow of what's happening in your heart. Christian, here today, you can't lose your salvation. You don't have to earn your salvation. You don't have to pay for your salvation. So get your praise on and be thankful for your salvation. We've talked about the assurance of salvation. We talked about the joy in your salvation. Now I want to talk about the identity of your salvation in verses 4 through 5. It says... These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women since they remain virgins. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were redeemed from humanity as the first fruits for God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. You are not saved by your works, but your salvation should change the focus of your work, church. The ones who were able to stand behind, beside the lamb on Mount Zion and able to sing at the top of their lungs are the ones who have been redeemed, but they are identified by four things which we will close with today. One, they are identified because they were pure. Look, Scripture says these are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women since they remain virgin. So some of you married folks are confused by this word choice. And some of you single folks are sweating this. I'll be happy to explain this choice in detail, but for the sake of time, I want to tell you what is being talked about. We are talking about spiritual purity here. That is your wholehearted devotion to Christ. If the ancient Israelites who followed the vows were guilty of spiritual adultery, then the saints who follow Christ are guilty or should be guilty of spiritual purity, church. They are undefiled. Today, Christians want the word and the world. You can't have both, church. The word makes it clear that you shouldn't desire the world or anything in it. See, the church has blurred the line when there should be a clear line. At the end of the day, there are only two types of people. They are saved and they are lost. They are redeemed and unredeemed. There is light and there is darkness. There is heaven and hell. There is nothing else. There is not divided by race, culture, where you live, how much money you have. You're either saved or not saved. You're been set free or you were in bondage. There is no in-between, church. Look, so stop praising him only on Sunday and learn to praise him every day of your life. That doesn't mean you won't get messed with the devil. It just means your focus is solely on pleasing the Lord. D.L. Moody says it like this, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. So give your whole life to him. Deal with the things in your life that are not honoring him. Don't laugh it off. You're as close to God as you want to be this morning. Secondly, they were devoted followers. I know that me and my wife have been married for um, 
20 some years now, 23 years. She looked at me like, you better know how much it is there, sweetie. And I tell her if she ever gets a suitcase and uh, starts to pack her stuff, I'm getting my mine too because wherever she's going, I'm going. And when it comes to your faith walk, church family, wherever Jesus takes you, you better follow. You better go wherever Jesus wants you to go. One way to keep yourself spiritually pure is to follow Jesus. The first followers asked if they could go and take care of every ever pressing matters that they had going on in their life. One follower says, look, can I go and bury my father? And he says, let the dead bury their own dead. We have excuses today why we won't follow Jesus or why we don't have time to follow Jesus. I don't want to put a percentage on this, but I would imagine an extremely high percentage of people in here today put Jesus on the outliers of their life. And the extra time in their life. Jesus is not the absolute priority in their life. They fit Jesus in around other things. I, I can do a flag football game in the morning, hit Jesus in the middle, and then go do a flag football game afterwards. I can read my Bible for two minutes before I go shopping for three hours. You do the math. Are you following Jesus or are you expecting him to follow you, church? Thirdly, it says, they are identified as first fruits. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Luke 10, 2. It says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. If you are saved, you are part of the harvest. Having an evangelist mindset, I always look at other people and I picture them with flames on them. I just have to know whether or not they're going to heaven or hell. But when I look at people who are lost, it makes me so thankful that I'm not. It makes me thankful that I am part of the harvest. I am blessed to be in a place where there is so much access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am blessed out of the billions of people who don't know Jesus Christ in this world. I am one of them that do. Are you thankful for that? Are you thankful that you have so much access to the God? See, it just overwhelms me. Like, how blessed am I that I am saved, that I have been chosen, that I have been set free? Are you thankful for that this morning, that you are the first fruits, that God has, has chosen you and set you apart to worship him? But lastly, they were truthful. That means the work of sanctification will profoundly impact their speech. Truthfulness stands alongside moral purity as an essential distinguishing mark of a Christian follower. That doesn't mean that you have never told a lie, but it means that you'll start to be convicted and you want to you wanna work on the things in your life that doesn't please God and doesn't honor God. This parallels the teaching of John's first epistle where the word says, no one who lives uh, sin in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has neither seen him or known him. I don't want to get to heaven and say that I wasn't serious about you. I don't want to get to heaven and have nothing to offer Jesus. I don't get to heaven and say, God, you, you did all this for me. You set me free. You saved me. I got an eternity in heaven, and yet I spent my life so focused on this world. Y'all, when I, when, I, when, I, when I stand before Jesus, and guess what? Every single person in here will stand before Jesus. Every person will give an account. Matter of fact, the Bible says that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. On earth, under earth, and in heaven. Everybody will confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of Father. And when I stand before God, I pray that he says the words to me, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want to sit there and say, I gave you my minimum while you gave me your all. I want to live my life completely and fully for Jesus. So as the worship team comes up and the prayer team comes up, I want to ask you this morning just three things. I want you to remove doubts in your life. When I went to seminary, I had some of the biggest struggles with my salvation and doubts because I studied so much and sometimes it could get in my head. And if you have any doubts whatsoever where you're going when, when you die, I want you to have the boldness and the courage to come forth today 
and literally just let us take you back and let's talk about it. Let's, let's remove doubts because here's what happens. Some of you are doing things right now that aren't honoring God. You know how I know that to be true? Because the Bible says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Every single day we do things that don't honor God. So I want you to remove whatever is a hindrance in your life that is keeping you from honoring God. Maybe it's because you don't know him and today will be the day of salvation for them and today's a great day to get baptized because it's 70 degrees. Next week will be 35 when we baptize. But secondly, look, when you remove doubts in your life, your praise will increase. Your praise will increase because you're so thankful that God has set you free. And thirdly, I'm gonna ask you just to make changes in your life to honor God. So I don't know what the word spoke to you this morning, but I know the word doesn't return void. So whatever God spoke to you today, I'm gonna ask after I pray and we stand and we worship like we've worshiped never before, you will come and deal with things in your life that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for who you are. We thank you for, for being a God who loves us and in spite of ourselves, who has set us free, who is able to keep us when we can't even keep ourselves, Lord. We thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for us, and whosoever shall believe in you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Or the fact of the matter is there are many people who are perishing. There's people in here today that are perishing. They may think Jesus is a joke, but they won't one day. So Lord, I pray that we would worship you in spirit and truth. And we wouldn't just say that we're redeemed. We would act like it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and respond to the word of God.